we are. All right. Chapter 9. Afterwards, Pimer wasn't certain why he had run from the dragon riders. He seemed to have been running from or to something ever since his voice had changed. In his panic, he supposed he aligned the old-time dragon riders with Lord Moran, and he did not want to encounter anyone connected with Lord Moran just then. Whatever, that night he plunged through the jungle into lack of breath, the painful stitch in his side and the darkness forced him to halt. Sinking to the ground, he rearranged his fire lizard comfortably and then fell asleep. Just as the sun was rising the next morning, she awoke him, snappy with hunger. He eased the worst of her pangs with his own fresh red fruit, cooled from the night air and succulently sweet. Then he turned north to make his way back to the beaches and fish for Farley, for that was the name he gave his little queen. Pushing his way through the underbrush, he tripped over a half-eaten runner beast carcass. Farley chattered with delight and ate flesh from bone, humming at him in pleasure. You'll choke like that, he said, and proceeded to hack smaller pieces, keeping about one knife slice ahead of her voracious appetite. When Farley had curled herself about Peemer's neck, thoroughly sated, her belly bulging, he sliced more meat from the dead runner. He figured the creature must have been killed during Threadfall, so the meat wouldn't as yet be tainted. Not only would it be a welcome change for him from fish, but red meat was better for Farley as well. Comforted by her sleeping weight about his neck, Peemer found thick grasses and rove a rough envelope in which to carry the meat. He estimated he had enough for several meals for himself and Farley, but if he could cook it, the meat wouldn't spoil as quickly in the heat. Continuing on a northwestern course back to the beach, he collected dry grass and sticks with which to build a fire. He was still heading generally north when he saw the unmistakable glint of water through the thinning trees to his left. He stopped, stared, unable to think how he could have mistaken his direction. A lake? However, if water was this close now... He pushed his way through the thinning screen of trees and bush and came out on a small rise. Below him were wide tidelands, which swept from the forest in an undulating grassy plain, broken by thick clumps of a gray-green bush. The plain continued on the other side of a broad river, which gradually widened until, in a distant point now hazy with heat, it must open its mouth into the sea. A breeze, scented with an oddly familiar pungent odor, dried the sweat on his face. Squinting against the sunlight, Peemer could see herd beasts grazing on the lush grass on both sides of the river. And yet there'd been threat here the day before, and no dragon riders flaming to prevent the deadly stuff burrowing into the ground and eating the land barren. As if to reassure himself, he poked at the soil with one of the sticks he'd collected, lifting up a clod of grass. Grubs fell from the roots, and Peemer was suitably awed by the abilities of those gray wrigglies, which could, all by themselves, keep such an enormous plain free from the ravages of thread. What do the grubs do? They eat the thread when it falls into the oh. ground. And those bloody old-timers hadn't so much as stirred from the weir during yesterday's fall. They weren't proper dragon riders at all. Flora and Lessa had been right to exile them here to the south, where the insignificant grubs did their work for them. Why, he could have been killed during that threadfall, and not a dragon rider around to protect him. Not, Peemer honestly admitted, that he hadn't been well able to protect himself. He gazed across the river, now noticing the swifter moving current that rippled toward the sea. He'd have fresh water for drinking here, as well as a retreat from thread. The jungle behind him would provide fruit and tubers, the meadow's inhabitants red meat for Farley. There was no need to trek to the sea again. He could stay here until Farley lost the worst of her hatchling appetite. Then he'd better start back to the southern hold. If he was careful, he could avoid being noticed by the old-timers until he made contact with the holder. What was his name? He was certain he'd heard Sibel mention the man by name. Torek. Yes, that was it. Torek. He set about making a rough circle of stones to protect his fire from the breeze, whistling softly. A fresh breeze brought him another whiff of that odor, sun-warmed and so puzzlingly familiar. Whatever it was must be down on the plain, for the wind came from that direction. Leaving his meat to roast at his fire, Peemer made his way down the slope, looking about at the tiny blooms and among the grasses with thread-pricked blades. He almost passed the first clump of bushes before he realized that their leaves were definitely familiar. Familiar, he thought as he reached out to touch one, but so much larger. He bruised the leaf as a final test and, sure enough, had to jerk his hand back as his finger smarted and then lost all feeling. 
numbweed. The whole plain was dotted with numbweed bushes, growing bigger and fuller than any he'd ever seen in the north. Why, if you harvested even one side of this plain, you'd keep everywhere on Pern and numbweed for the entire pass. Master Oldive ought to know about this place. A petulant squeak in his ear warned him that Farley had roused, probably smelling the roasted meat. He carefully broke off some large numbweed leaves and wrapped their cut stems in a thick blade of grass, returned to the fire. Then, he, when he had given Farley a few half-done pieces of meat, she was quite content to curl up for the rest of her nap. Then Peemer bruised a numbweed leaf between two flat, clean stones. He rubbed the wet side of the stones against his cuts, shivering at the slight sting of the raw numbweed before its anesthetic properties took effect. He was careful not to rub the stone too deep, for raw numbweed must be used sparingly, or you could get horrible blisters and end up with scars. As he settled by the fire to wait for his meat to cook, he knew he'd be sorry to leave here. He said that to himself the next morning when he rose, and that evening when he curled up in the shelter he'd made for Farley and himself. He really ought to try to get word back to the Harper Hall. Each day, however, found him too busy catering to the needs of a rapidly growing fire lizard to make provisions for a journey of possibly several days. He spent a whole day trying to catch a fish for the oils needed to soothe Farley's flaking skin. Then thread again. This time he was adequately prepared and forewarned. Farley went hysterical with alarm, her eyes wheeling furiously with the red of anger as she rose on her wings and, shrieking defiance to the northeast, suddenly flicked out. When Peemer called her, she popped back in, scolded him furiously, and then disappeared. She'd gone between before, inadvertently scared by some odd noise or other, so that it wasn't until she remained away for much longer than before that Peemer began to wonder what had frightened her. He looked northeast, noticing as his eyes swept across the plains that the animals were all moving toward the river with considerable haste. The quick blossom of flame against the sky caught his eyes, and he saw not only Thread's gray rain, but the distant motes of dragons. He had made preparations against the next fall of Thread, determined never to spend another eternity under a rock ledge. He had found a sunken tree trunk where the river flowed out of the forest. Diving into the water, he kicked down to the depth at which drowning thread could no longer sting. There, he hooked his arm around the tree trunk and poked back to the surface a thick reed, through which he was then able to breathe. It was not the most comfortable of hideaways, and fish constantly mistook his arms and legs for outsized thread, so he had to keep moving. Time, too, seemed motionless, and it felt like hours had passed before the impact circles of thread on the water surface ceased. He was glad when, a mighty, when, with a mighty kick of his legs, he burst back into the air, nearly overturning a small runner. In fact, the shallows seemed to be blanketed with animals, as if his eruption from the depths had been a signal, or perhaps his presence had frightened them. The creatures began to struggle toward the shore, shake themselves, and then rapidly take off down the plain. Some were bawling with pain, and he saw a number with bloody face score where thread had stung them. He also noticed some of the injured making to the numbweed bushes and rubbing against the leaves. Peemer waded to the bank, calling for Farley as he sank to the solid ground. His arms and legs felt leaden from his efforts to discourage fish from eating him. Farley burst into view just above him, chittering with relief and anxiety. She landed on his shoulder, wrapping her tail about his neck and stroking his cheek with her head, one paw wrapped around his ear, the other anchored to his nose. They comforted each other for a long moment. Then Peemer felt Farley's body go taut. She peered around his face and began to chatter angrily, twisting about. At first, Peemer saw nothing to alarm him. Farley loosed her hold on his nose, and he realized that she was pointing skyward. He saw the wherries then, circling high, and knew that something had not survived the fall. If wherries were after it, it was something that would also feed him and his fire lizard. Farley seemed as eager as he to beat the wherries to their victim, and she chattered encouragement as he found a stout stick and made his way up the river bank. Calm down, Callie. Most of the creatures that had taken refuge in the river had disappeared, but he kept a wary eye for snakes and large crawlers that might also have found sanctuary in the river. He saw the bulge of the fallen runner beast, half hidden under a large numbweed bush. To his surprise, it heaved upward, its bloody flank crawling with grubs. The poor thing couldn't still be alive. He raised his stick to put an end to the creature's pain when he realized that the movement came from under the animal, spasmodic and desperate. 
Farley hopped from his shoulder and chittered, touching a tiny protruding hoof that Peemer hadn't noticed. It had been a female runner beast. With an exclamation, Peemer grabbed the hind legs and pulled the corpse from the youngster. The fee pulled the corpse from the youngster the female had given her life to protect from thread. Bleeding, it staggered to its feet, shedding a carpet of grubs, and hobbled the few steps to Peemer, its head and shoulders scored here and there by thread. Almost absently, Peemer stroked the furry head and scratched behind the ear cup, feeling its rough tongue licking his skin. Then he saw the long, shallow scrape on the little beast's right leg. So that's why you didn't make it to the river, huh, you poor stupid thing, said Peemer, gathering it closer to him, and your dam sheltered you with her body. Brave thing to do. It bleated again, looking anxiously up at him. Farley chirped and stroked her body against the uninjured leg before she moved on to start making a meal off the dead runner. With a sense of propriety, Peemer took the youngster off to the river to bathe its wound, treat it with numbweed and wrap it with a broad river plant to keep off insects. He tethered it with his fishing line and then went back to slice off enough meat for several meals. The wherries were closing in. Farley was sated enough not to resist leaving the carcass, nor did she object when Peemer carried Little Stupid back to their forest shelter. As Peemer settled down to sleep that night, he had Stupid curled tightly against him along his back and Farley draped across his shoulders. He had fully intended to use the interval between this fall and the next to make his way to the southern hold, but he really couldn't leave Stupid, crippled as well as motherless. The leg would heal with care and rest. Once Stupid was walking easily, after the next thread fall, he would definitely make tracks for Southern. Despite the lateness of the hour, would he though? Would he? the Master Harper could see light coming from his study window as he wearily made his way from the meadow where Leoth and Natan had just left him. He was very tired, but well satisfied with the results of his efforts over the last four days. Zare, balancing on his shoulder, cheeped an affirmative. Robinson smiled to himself and rubbed the little bronze's neck. And Sibel and Manoli are going to be satisfied, too. Unless, of course, there's been word from that scamp that they haven't been able to send me. He saw the half of the great hall door swing into darkness and wagered with himself who waited for him there in the dark. Master? He was right. It was Manoli. You were away so long, Master, she cried in a soft voice as she closed the door behind him and spun the wheel to lock the bolts tightly in floor and ceiling. Ah, uh, but I've accomplished much. Any news from Peemer? No, and her shoulders drooped noticeably. We would have sent you word instantly. He put his arm about her slender shoulders comfortingly. Is Sibel awake as well? Yes, indeed, she gave a chuckle. Natan sent Tris to warn us, or you'd have been locked out of your own hall. Not for long, my dear girl. Not for long. They were climbing the steps now, and he noticed that she slowed her pace to match his. He was tired, true, but worse, he no longer commanded the resilience that made no bother of late hours. Lord Grohe was back two days ago, Master. Why did you have to stay so long at Nabol? He felt her shoulders give a convulsive shudder under his arm. I wouldn't have stayed at that place a moment longer than I had to. Not the most congenial of holds, to be sure. I can't think what can have happened to all the wine Lord Fax appropriated in his conquest. He had some good pressings, too. Moran can't have drunk it all in a bare thirteen or fourteen turns. You know bend and wine, then, Manoli teased him. Not you unfeeling wretch. Then I'm more amazed than ever that you stayed so long. I had to, he replied, amazed at the irritation in his voice. But they had reached his rooms now, and he opened the door, grateful for the sight of the familiar disorder of his workroom and the welcoming smile on Sibel's face. The journeyman was on his feet, helping his master out of his flying gear and guiding him to a chair, while Manoli poured a goblet of a decent bend in wine. "'Now, sir, have you a tale to tell?' asked Sibel, lightly taunting his ma with his master's usual greeting. "'Could we not have come to Nabol and help speed matters?' "'I would have thought you'd seen enough of Nabol hold to last a turn or two, said Master Robinton, sipping at his wine. "'He's got news, Sibel,' said Manoli, narrowing her eyes to glare at her master. "'I can tell that look on his face. Smug, that's what he is. "'Did you learn what happened to Peemer at Nabol?' "'No, I'm afraid. I didn't find out about Peemer, but among other equally important things, "'I have arranged matters so that we don't have to worry about Nabol hold supplying the old-timers with northern goods.' 
or receiving a further embarrassing riches of, riches of fire lizard eggs in that otherwise impoverished hold. Then none of the disappointed heirs caused trouble during the confirmation, asked Sibel. Master Robinson waggled his fingers, a sly smile on his face. Not to speak of, though Hittet is a master of the snide remark. They could scarcely contend the nomination since it had been made before such notable witnesses. Besides, I never bothered to disabuse them of the notion that Benden and the other Lord Holders would call the heir to account for the sins of his predecessor. Master Robinson beamed at the reaction of his journeyman to his strategy. It afforded me considerable pleasure to help the new Lord Dector send the worthless lot back to improve their beggared holds. And Lord Dector? asked Sibel. A good choice, however unwillingly. I pointed out to him adroitly that if he merely regarded his hold as a flagging business and applied the same ingenuity and industry with which he had built a flourishing carting trade, he would find that the hold would respond and repair. I also pointed out that in his four sons he has able assistants and ministers, a fortune few lords can enjoy. However, he did have one matter he was particularly anxious to resolve. The harper paused. He looked at the expectant faces. A matter that just happens to march kindly with a problem we face. He turned to Manoli. You'd best ready that boat of yours. He had started referring to her skiff in that manner after he and Manoli had been storm-lost on his one voyage to the southern hold the previous turn. Now Manoli's face brightened, and Sibel sat up straight, eyes wide with anticipation. We won't locate Pemer by whistling for him from the north. You two go south. Make certain that Torek lets the old-timers know, if you can't carry the message discreetly to them yourselves, that Moran is dead and that his successor supports Benjen Weir. I believe that Master Oldive wants you to bring back some of those herbs and powders. He used up a large portion of his supplies on Moran. But don't you dare return until you've found Peemer. <laughs>